Felix here, good evening or good morning to you. I just had a momentary panic. YouTube gave me an alert saying live streaming currently not available. I was like tearing up my hair. But here we are, uh, live, uh, fantastic here from Hong Kong. Good morning, good evening to where you, wherever you are in the world. And markets are literally about to open. Um, and so, of course, we should look at that straight away, guys. As always, it's not financial advice. It's just for entertainment only. Uh, I welcome all of your questions, uh, all of your um, answers, all of your comments, all of your critiques, uh, absolutely everything as always. So don't be shy. Uh, now, we, let's have a quick look at the futures here. Everything is green, right? Uh, basically, everything is green. All of the markets up. Uh, everything looking good. Even cryptos. Uh, Bitcoin is substantially above 40,000 now, which is very, very nice to see. Uh, so... Is it going to be a good day? Is it going to be a great day? Well, there is actually a certain pattern, which is that certain stocks go up every Friday. And I've been looking at that a little bit, so we're going to talk about that. We are also going to talk about stock volatility, um, and what the Fed thinks about that, you know, is the Fed going to slow down in the 300 billion of assets they're buying a month? Um, Cybersecurity stocks, uh, Palo Alto, for example, had some really great numbers today. I think that whole sector is going to fly. Uh, Biden's proposal of a global corporate tax rate, what is that going to do to stocks? We have um, also Biden requiring or suggesting that a Bitcoin transactions over 10,000 US dollars be reported to the Indian Revenue. So we'll discuss that. And also allegedly a doubling of the inland revenue workforce. Not something that every American taxpayer is going to be particularly exciting about, excited about. Uh, now, pre-market here, you can see, actually, we are, the market is, is on, so we can see what's actually happening here to so our uh, favorite stocks, absolutely live. And why am I not on the screen? You might wonder. Well, there I am. Uh, here I am back. Um, uh, and yes, we are going to look at Palantir, of course. There is a little bit of news out um, and... Um, um, we are definitely shooters, Joe. We are definitely going to talk about Bitcoin uh, and what's, what's all that about and, and the latest uh, and recent things that Elon has said today. Um, uh, Chris is saying when the market starts red, sometimes it ends up green. Well, at the moment, the market is, well, it's, it's sort of a half-half situation, isn't it? But the more growthy stocks, things like Tesla, um, Palantir here are, are in the green uh, ever so slightly. And what is quite interesting, NEO is now down a little bit. And now, one thing you see with, if you look at the data that retail investors like you and me tend to buy in the first hour of the market and professional investors, Wall Street, tend to buy later in the day. And that's pretty much a fact, uh, nothing to argue about there. So we seem to act more instantly, instantaneously on news, um, whereas the banks and the funds tend to work, wait a little bit longer. Um, uh, great of you guys to join everyone here. I I'm not going to shout everybody out, but uh, a lot of you, you regular CLA, Jolly, Philip, Luis, Future, A to B, Chris, of course, one of our lovely members. Um, and he now has the power to kick you out. So be very nice to Chris. Uh, just enough. Uh, uh, Kuhn, uh, another one of our lovely members are here. Welcome uh, to all of you guys. Apologies if I missed some of you. Uh, and yes, we can check into all of your favorite stocks as usual. Um, let's have a quick look before we get, get going here with NEO. And can you see these little faint vertical lines I've put in? And those are... Fridays. Yes, you spotted that correctly. Every seven days I put in a line uh, and it's not some sort of a malaise on, on my account because really uh, every Friday, 16th of April, bump up 1.2%. Uh, 23rd of April, up 3.8%. 30th of April, up 2%. 7th of May, of May up 0.7%. And then last week, 14th of May, up 7%. So Today, we are on that account, uh, should be expecting a green day. And it does seem to be a sort of end of the week um, bounce that we see. We get a little bit hit over the head during the week. And then for some reason, we seem to always recover on Fridays. And you see that pattern with a lot of growth stocks. And it's kind of unusual to see that five weeks in a row. Uh, so we could make that six today, although at the moment, NEO is down a little. But it doesn't matter much matter a lot what happens in the first trading hour because that's typically retail investors and i'm not saying you and me don't matter but in terms of our market volume um it, it does philip is saying uh, let's save the goat and smash that like button uh, yes please for every one of your likes guys i donate one cent to the gentle barn we're adopting a goat this month uh, and he's a rather handsome looking goat 
Um, uh, Shoeless Joe says, I like to kick my weekend off with a Neo binge. Do you think that's sim simply as simple as that? I mean, people no longer get their wages on Friday, all those kind of things. So that can't be possibly be the reason. So, you know, what what is it really? Well, we are going to look at some other stocks here, of course. Also, uh, someone's shouting out Tesla. Uh, Tesla is heading up. Um, yes, it is. It is. It is improving. Absolutely. It's smashed through just well, no, it's still slightly above that Fibonacci line here of 591. So we are still a little bit there on, on, on the on the, the sketchy side. Um, uh, Philip thinks that everybody's happy on Fridays and everybody's sad on Mondays must reflect uh, over into our trading behavior. Perhaps it, it is simply simply something as irrational as that <laughs> and as simple as that. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more big big picture here while we, while we uh, look at what's happening here with the market. So people are obviously inflation trade, right? That's, that's what everyone's talking about. Everyone's discussing pretty much nothing else. Uh, I've just added this last weekend a big section on how to trade in inflation, times of inflation uh, onto my course program, guys. So I encourage you to check that out, uh, how to build wealth. Um, and uh, there's lots and lots and lots of stuff on here. The, the course link is below in the description. I'll put that up in a second as well. And I added here a whole section on not just investor psychology, uh, but also um, inflation investing, growth stocks and inflation, uh, key economic indicators, and when macro and microeconomics, which, which ones matter. Uh, and, and a lot of them do not. Uh, so do check that out, guys. And I'll put um, the code just below, guys. The code is FREEDOM until the uh, 23rd of May. You get 39% off. So do uh, check that out. It's a, uh, a lot of you guys have already joined that and seem to be very, very much enjoying it. Now, but let's look at the economic picture here. So another Fed speech coming out today. We had one last night and everybody's talking about tapering. Are they going to taper off? Well, at some point they'll need to because at the moment the Fed is buying not just 130 billion or so in bonds, but 300 billion US dollars in assets monthly including all their reinvestments. And that's a tremendous amount of money, right? And you and I are basically, um, you know, uh, enjoying the free drinks. Uh, we are basically uh, sitting in a bar, we're getting served free drinks, and we're not too worried about it because the free drinks are still, you know, they keep coming. And the barkeeper says to us, well, it might stop at some point, uh, but we are not really worried about that because we're very comfortable, we keep getting free booze, uh, and life is good. And that's basically what the stock market is doing at the moment. And it'll continue to do that until that tapering off is imminent. And tapering just means that they buy a little bit less. So less than 300 billion US dollars uh, would have an impact. And if you go back a long time to sort of 1994, and when the, we came out of the, the sort of 90s bubble, um, strong economic growth, 4%, 4.5%, and they wanted to not kill the growth too early, so they waited. And then they raised interest rates, I don't know, seven times in 18 months or something like that. And of course, when they, you know, they, they killed the market. So they tend to, when they wait too long, overreact again, because then the numbers get scary if they do. So is that going to affect things? Well, yes, it is going to affect growth stocks, because growth stocks are valued at future profits and the future profits are valued at present value. And in that calculation, the discounted cash flow model that I also teach you how to do yourself in my course, uh, that is affected by interest rates. So if inflation goes up, interest rates inevitably go up um, and therefore the golden goose of growth stocks get killed. Um, and therefore, I think really, and I said this at the beginning of the year, guys, I, if you were watching me then, I said this in January, uh, I said, buy some value at that time. Um, now, as always, guys, of course, this is not my financial advice, but I was just saying that's what I was doing. And I've been doing that because I was saying, yes, we are at the nearer peak of this growth market. It's not going to end because, you know, the free drinks are still coming. But there will be a point when the Fed will reduce the amount of, mo of money it throws at the market. And 300 billion a month is pretty, pretty insane. And on top of that, you have to add to the Biden administration spending plans, which are also massive. Here is a, a real democratic president who really wants to throw money at the people and infrastructure and all sorts of things. And that, again, is going to have an impact on, uh, on inflation pressures, at least the way the Fed sees it. 
So uh, I think that is the one really big thing to, to think about is how to invest in times of inflation uh, and what to do with growth stocks in this period. And should we be buying more growth stocks or should we perhaps be putting a little bit of a break on that and buying the things that do well in infl times of inflation? And what does well? Well, it's the stuff with lots of good cash flow, the highly profitable companies, the companies that can pass on increases in inflationary costs to their customers. So, you know, you're still going to buy Coca-Cola if it's a cent more, right? You're still going to buy your Apple iPhone if it's an extra $10. Those kind of companies have a pricing power. And that is therefore something I think really to look, look into. Uh, the second uh, big story, I think cybersecurity stocks are definitely becoming more and more of an issue. We saw uh, Palo Alto having some really fantastic numbers out today. Uh, and you might may, may or may not invest in that. The, the whole space, I think, is becoming uh, more and more interesting because ransomware attacks and these kind of things. And what are they up? They're up 5.3%, absolutely glowing. And that is because the earnings surprise was 7.3% up here. I'm sure it's um, fifth straight earnings beat. We believe this is a cloud cybersecurity re-rating story in motion. And we view Palo Alto stock as having a strong upward trajectory over the next year. As the street starts to fully appreciate the cloud transformation playing out. Um, White hot growth that cybersecurity players are seeing across the board. Uh, Bellwether. So, uh, Wetbush is maintaining its outperform rating in a price target of 450, and we are at 360. So, a, a reasonable upside there. Um, perhaps a, a, a good thing to buy. We've just flown above the 100 day moving average line here. Uh, so, I think that is an interesting one to look at. Uh, or perhaps wait a day if you if you do think that today's exuberance is a little overdone and we might come down a few percentage points again. Uh, that depends on your strategy. I like to buy things on the way up rather than on the way down, but everybody has a different feeling. And if you, again, if you want to know how to time the market, guys, check out my course below. Uh, the coupon code is FREEDOM. Um, uh, the other, there are two more kind of big kind of news items I want us to to look at and then of course we'll take some questions and Chris is asking are we going to do a zoom call in today's stream uh, we can certainly give it a go uh, uh, Chris I'll just uh, start my zoom up in a minute um, the US is proposing a global corporate minimum tax rate and he'd thrown out that number of 21 percent previously now the number being suggested is 15 percent which is funnily enough exactly the corporate tax rate we have here in Hong Kong actually it goes up to 16.5 if I'm not mistaken uh, but it, it, it's in that kind of level level so a lot of the kind of softer uh, places like Hong Kong Singapore those kind of um, uh, low tax environments will be okay with that uh, but the kind of zero percent tax rate places of course will not be and Europe is welcoming it but is it going to happen and what would it mean well it's all about digital taxation really and that's what that is about is about companies like Amazon who have some sort of holding company somewhere strange and they're charging or Starbucks and whatever companies and they are charging their subsidiaries in each country a very very big licensing fee and therefore they're moving most of their corporate profits into some sort of tax haven and then the local tax authorities are left with very little. So that's a big deal here that could take place at least on the G20 level which would be you know the biggest 20 economies in the world could introduce that and could introduce some sort of tax sharing system. Don't know if that's going to happen but it'd be an interesting one and it certainly wouldn't be good for companies like Amazon or Microsoft or anybody else who's really aggressive in that space. Now, Bitcoin looking very pop promising here in the futures. Um, it is at the moment, so not futures, at 41,211, recovering very nicely. Two proposals here. Well, one really is that every transaction over 10,000 US dollars in crypto in the US needs to be reported to the IRS. And that includes businesses and investors and exchanges. So the IRS would get an enormous amount of information and they are hoping this will discourage people from using cryptocurrencies to sort of, uh, you know, uh, obfuscate their earnings. So I think that is probably fairly likely to come because that's a pretty easy one. And at the same time, the IRS is meant to 
double its workforce. Yes, double. So twice the numbers of tax inspectors uh, and some sort of permanent increase in budget there. And they are basically saying, well, how are we going to handle all that data? That'll be a challenge. So uh, I, I smell a Palantir contract coming up there because who else is going to be able to handle uh, the tax data, not just of 300 plus million Americans, but all the American corporations, every single trade over 10,000 US dollars. That is phenomenal data. To tie that all together across different accounts and families and company structures and stuff, I think that is a Palantir job. So um, that is uh, therefore, I think, something that could be quite interesting for Palantir from that point of view. Uh, Philip is uh, shouting out here, everybody buy BlackBerry, we need security, uh, and I'm also down 60% uh, or so. Yeah, and they, again, they also fit into that cybersecurity uh, space um, as well, absolutely. Um, um, so guys, you got any questions here? Mike is asking, why is Palantir struggling so much? Uh, why is it not doing the rally that we wanted to do? Okay, I think there are probably two answers to that. Uh, one is analysts don't like companies that are very top heavy in the sense that they have 10 customers say that are very important to them because you lose one or two of those and, and you have a problem. And that's kind of where Palantir is coming from. And a lot of their business is essentially US government business. Somehow they see that as a risk. I actually think that business is incredibly loyal and, and sticky. And there was a uh, news ad today, which I shared on our Discord earlier, guys. Um, where is our Palantir channel? Here it is. And that is exactly here. Uh, the VA contract just got extended, at least temporarily. You see how the government is trying to improve their websites here? Uh, they are getting, getting with it. Uh, this is a contract that has been extended um, temporarily because the actual um, re-issuing uh, process is sort of on hold. It's delaying the award. So the VA has a continuing need for data management and operational decision support. And they are basically extending the contract here, um, giving Palantir 4.1 million right away, and it might uh, increase to 8.1 million if they extend it another three months here. So it's a profitable contract for them. And it's just being extended because the whole procurement process is somewhere somewhere uh, up in the air, which is good news for, for, for Palantir, I think. Um, but the analysts don't seem to really see the value in these government contracts. I think they'll come around eventually, but they'd rather Palantir have 500 or 1,000 smaller corporate customers. And that's one thing that counts against them. Um, I think the second part is probably politics. I, I do think this whole um, uh, notion of powering drones that are killing people and you know ICE deportations and this kind of stuff, a lot of people don't want to get dragged into the politics of that. So I think even funds and hedge funds are just thinking, well, I'm, I'm not, I, I can invest in something else without the risk of getting tarnished by this and having people pick at my my uh, my office and you know what in a way that's driving the the prices down uh, which perhaps in the long run because people will eventually get over that and realize it for in my view the brilliant absolutely brilliant software that it is uh, and will push that that company higher i think in the long run the market is generally rational not necessarily always accurate in how it values things, but I think at the moment Palantir is in, the, in that kind of um, downward circle. It really, for me, the, the main risk with buying Palantir right now at $20, it's just that when, not if, but when the Fed announces tapering, and that could come in Q3, that could come in Q4. Um, most investors and analysts seem to expect it in Q3, uh, but the job numbers were not so good. Pass that will delay a little bit. Uh, we have some more jobs, jobs numbers coming out. If they are terrible again, it'll push it back a little bit. But when that does happen, growth stocks like this will still uh, get hit somewhat. So I think we need to bear that in mind that we either are ready to then uh, buy uh, and, and sort of discount uh, average down or we wait a little bit. Though having said that, you know, a lot of what's the saying, a lot of fortunes have been lost waiting for the dip. So my, my, my method is always I, I buy absolutely every single month uh, uh, sort of near blindly. Uh, and, and again, that's something guys I, I teach in my course down below. Uh, a real strategy to kind of take the emotion out of investing and just to build long-term positions that actually become profitable uh, over time. 
Ähm, Scott Owen Smith, mein Ding in Alibaba Technical Analysis. Thanks, absolute pleasure. Um, you, 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 you probably know if you watch me that I am a barber enthusiast. I've been a little bit more quiet on barber lately, uh, although not that quiet. I do share quite a bit on our um, a Discord over here. Um, there are quite some, some bits of news. They are reducing some of the insurance charges to merchants on Tmall. Um, and we also have uh, one of the uh, key insurance guys returning to. And, but at the moment, there isn't a great deal happening here, right? So if you look at, let me get ten, rid of Tencent here. Uh, you know, the red sell-off here was, of course, the Ant IPO being cancelled. The purple sell-off was the antitrust investigation, which is over. Uh, and the world thought it was over for a little while. And now we are at a price, which is basically where we were uh, at, at the bottom of that announcement at Christmas Eve, which is just bizarre and, and to me, it is in a market being utterly irrational. I don't really get it. It makes no sense. We are seeing big value investors jumping in on this. And again, let me share that with you. So we have um, in here now Greg Alexander, Alexander rather, a, a big, big uh, value investor, Charlie Munger, uh, Pabra Investors. So people are really adding to their positions who understand and appreciate the bullishness, profitability, dominance, market share, cloud business, growth, all the fantastic stuff that is in Baba. Uh, but the market is, is, isn't really do, doing very much. So what have we got here? Let's have a look at the actual chart in the last couple of days. Um, we can throw in some Fibonacci lines here. So we are basically uh, still below the 214 line, which is our next kind of resistance uh, line. We are in fact Exactly, we had down again today. Hong Kong, we were also down, so that makes sense. We are exactly where we were the previous day at the opening, or at the low of that day, really, sitting at sort of 212, something like that. So we, we are not really getting trajectory in, into this. Uh, I think we will crawl our way back up, up into the 220s, perhaps even 225, which is where we're sort of hovering about before. But there simply is a complete lack of momentum in, in, in this this stock, which is just bizarre because obviously people don't read numbers very well. But look at this is the momentum here. And what's the what's the 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 trend with momentum? It's that, right? It's not improving. And yes, we have a little bit of a recovery uh, down here, but it still isn't uh, anything near what we need. So if you throw a few other indicators at this, like a Williams R, for example, which is a pretty fast one. So you'd get a buy signal if you cross this red line down here, right? If we crossed from below to above that, well, we go up a little bit and then we get a red day, right? And we sort of zigzag now for ages down in this, um, yeah, sort of almost oversold territory and simply not going up very much. Um, and Hans, you are very right. You are saying here you like the comments that uh, they are going to invest more in new areas of business. I like it. I like my investments to compound. I don't want them sitting on 70 billion US dollars of cash. I want them to reinvest that into business that will be more and more profitable. Like we've seen with Tencent, they've acquired something like 30 gaming companies in the last five months or something insane. And that's what you do with lots of cash, right? You invest, you reinvest, you build the business, you make it more profitable, you make it grow faster. But you know what? Again, analysts don't like that. It's always a trick question in most analyst calls is, are you going to reinvest the profits or um, you know are you focused more on short-term profits or more on long-term growth you see that question on almost every call and it's a um a question between a rock and a hard place because if you say we're going to favor growth the analysts will downgrade you guaranteed if you say we favor profits the analysts will write something snotty and say uh, well they have a very short-term outlook we're not sure about the long-term viability of the business so you can't really win with that question and that's an unfortunate thing that analysts do to most ceos and i thought they handled it very honestly they just said yes we're going to reinvest a lot of money uh, but then they make so much money like why should they uh, of course they should and it's been a very successful strategy for them right but um the market isn't necessarily gonna love it so really my take on barber is it isn't going to go anywhere in the near term uh, and that just means it's a great value buy for those with very long-term horizons uh, those with short-term horizons i'd say uh, go somewhere else um 
Scott Owen, you're talking about stochastics. I haven't looked at that. Um, uh, yeah, that did give you a buy signal. You are quite right. Uh, on the 17th of May or thereabouts. Let me show you that down here. You see where that blue line crosses above the orange one? That does give you a bit of a buy indicator, but it's at a super, super low level. So I think this one, you, you have to kind of see the um, the history of it, right? So it gave you a buy signal and a sell signal also here uh, with this one. So if you are trading in that kind of speed and you have to always look at how long doesn't do my indicators, are they valid for? So uh, then you would have bought here, uh, you would have exited here, so you would have bought at about 230, 232, and you would have exited at about 238. Um, I honestly don't do trades that are, that are 1% uh, up or down. I know some people do, and you can do it very profitably. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but for me, it's more of a long-term buy. So I don't think stochastics give you that sort of long-term change in bullishness because it gives you a buy signal every single time we go up a, 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 you know a couple of dollars it isn't wrong i mean it did call this this quite quite well and yes we are up it called 212 and we are sitting at 213 right so it's up a dollar nothing wrong with that indicator but it is just a very um a very uh, kind of fine one if, if you understand understand what i mean um Shulis Joe uh, was asking, when you value stocks, how much value do you add for unrealized future potential? So again, valuing stocks is, there are two sides to it, right? There is the fundamental analysis, where you really look at the income statements, uh, where you look at their margins, their gross margins, their net margins, you look at anything unusual they've got going on there, you look at how much depreciation they have, uh, you look at the amortization, you look at... Um, quarter by quarter, how is it growing? How cyclical is it? All of those factors can, you know, really do matter. And you see a continuous improvement in margins. Our revenue is always going up and our margins increasing with that. That's kind of what you, what you want to see. You look at their free cash flow, their need for capital, all these things you can see. And again, guys, I obviously teach that in my course, how to actually understand income statements because it's a super important thing to do. And then you take that into a discounted cash flow model, um, all that information. And again, I give you the templates and all the methods of how you can do that yourself. And within that, you look very, very much forward uh, at five or 10 years out. And why? Because the stock market is always forward looking. We don't really care about last year's numbers. For us, they have to be in line with expectations. If they are above expectations, the stock goes up, in theory at least. If they are below expectations, the stock gets hit over the head. And it is always the numbers versus expectations, not so much the numbers versus last year's numbers or previous quarter's numbers, because that's all old news to us. So uh, looking at how much growth there is is super, super important. And even if you invest in something, say, like a Microsoft or something, which is a pretty ancient company by, by tech standards, highly profitable, great margins, lots of free cash flow, you still look at the growth, right? And, you know, what's their growth going to be five, five years out? Because you are paying, I, I don't know, what, what's the, what's the um, you know, multiple on, 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 on um, Microsoft, um, Price over earnings, uh, 22. Is it? No, no, that sounds a little bit low. Uh, so forward PE is 28. So that's again forward, right? So next year's earnings, you're paying 28 times for that. So you want those earnings to comp continue to grow. Uh, otherwise, why are you paying 28 times for that, for that business? If you would acquire a privately owned business, you very rarely pay more than 5x or 8x for something. But for these companies, you do it because you think Microsoft is going to be 30% or 25% at least bigger every year. So you compound that over 10 years and that becomes, I don't know, you know, 400% growth or something on the base there, in which case your 28% uh, multiplier isn't quite as great as you thought it would be, right? So that's why I think it's, it's super important to um, always look forward. Um, and that's why I always say and preach and teach uh, look at the moat, look at the moat, and look at the moat, even for growth stocks, because how easy is it for someone to, to, to replace that business? Uh, are they really dominant? Is their tech really that much better? And with Palantir, for example, I think their tech simply is that much better. Yes, I, I think, they, think they are. 
Um, Raphael is asking about BYD. I also shared something about that in our Discord today, which I thought was quite interesting. And again, guys, you can get there through the uh, the Patreon link, of course, which is at the top of the live chat, uh, and you can join us over there. And there is a Chinese news article out that BYD has just delivered the 500th pure EV bus to the UK. Uh, so let me open that up for you because it's an interesting one because people look past BYD a lot. It's a Chinese article. It just isn't as sexy as, say, NEO is. Uh, but they are powering in Hong Kong. I mean, in Hong Kong, right? If you go across the border one hour's drive here in Shenzhen, they have 6,000 electric buses. The whole city has only electric buses. And this is where they're coming from, from BYD. Um, and, um, you know, they are now powering the, the ones in the, um, in, in, in the UK and in London. They're exporting them to all over the world. And that's a pretty good deal for them because um, it's profitable. Uh, so they have so far they've delivered 65,000 pure EV buses gl globally. Uh, that's pretty insane, and um, and the cumulative sales of EV vehicles has exceeded one million. So they are a giant in the EV space that is just overlooked a great deal uh, for a particular reason. Really, I think it's just because it's a little bit older. People just think ah, it's another old company, but it is definitely an EV play that's interesting. Just the branding isn't your sort of Tesla or your Neo. It's just a bit more of a conservative company. Um, CH uh, NMGRF is indeed ramping up before the official listing. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Robert isn't with us. Uh, he's one of our lovely members and he is an absolute uh, uh, whiz and uh, knows everything about Nouveau Monde. So yeah, that's absolutely flying on that news. It's probably on here somewhere, is it? No. Bank of England aims for greener corporate bond portfolio. Interesting. Um, no, Spain workers all vaccinated tourists, though. But no, it isn't on here. But yes, they are. They are getting listed uh, uh, properly. It won't be an OTC. They'll be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So that'll throw some money in on that. So uh, I think this is going to recover very nicely. Uh, then probably as soon as they are listed, people are going to take profits uh, and that's going to go. Um, and um, uh, Michael Kocha here, if you uh, PL, Pal Palantir analysis, we could do it again. Uh, give me a couple of minutes. We, we look at Palantir again very, very gladly. Um, so I think it's definitely an interesting play. For me, actually, it's a long-term um, investment, um, Nouveau Monde, but uh, this is obviously going to give it a, a nice boost. Uh, but we have also been punished quite, quite severely, right? I mean, we were up here in the, in, the, in, the, in the low 20s, and now we are at 15, but nice to see uh, that bounce. So a quick look at the market here live. Uh, Nvidia up 3.5%. Uh, stock split indeed. Flame Lane, you are quite spot on on that. So let's have a quick look at NVDA. Uh, let's have a look. It's the announcement up here. Tight supply here. It proposes four to one stock split. Um, the dividend is would make the stock ownership more accessible to investors and employees. The dividend is conditioned on shareholder approval. The dividend? Dividend. That's... Okay. Um, oh, so they're, they're just going to going to okay. The dividend will be you get three extra stocks basically. That, that, that that's the wording here, um, and it's going to increase the number of shares to four billion. And if approved, that will happen on June twenty one. I'm generally a fan of stock splits because a lot of the market slightly irrationally thinks that stocks that with lower nominal price points are somehow cheaper of course they are and there's no 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 sense in that whatsoever but you see it with a lot of the um you know penny stocks and the kind of uh, meme stocks and stuff a lot of them are the ones that are uh, at very very low nominal value so i think it makes sense when you get to a certain price point um, and as they're saying also for employee stock options it makes it a little bit easier for them to dish them out in uh, you know values of uh, you know say 130 rather than 500 or 600 so i think i think it's a good move it doesn't really make much of a difference in the long run it just makes the stock a little bit more easy to trade in smaller numbers which is uh, probably good 
Uh, Bob, a uh, huge welcome to you. Uh, thanks for joining in. Um, any news about NEO? Uh, well, actually, there is a news item on NEO, and I appreciate you Palantir uh, fans. Uh, we are going to look at the Palantir chart in just a second as well. There's literally just an article out just before we came live here that NEO's battery supplier, CATL, they also have a joint venture company together, the NEO Battery Company, that basically owns all the batteries that are being leased out to owners and users. Uh, they, that is a joint venture with CATL. They're going to release sodium iron batteries. And I'm going to have to share this with Robert because he's going to love this. Uh, we have a uh, hugely active raw, EV raw material article here, uh, which is being powered by somebody who really knows something about that stuff because he's an industry not too unrelated. And they are going to build sodium ion batteries. Sodium is what? It's salt, right? Which is obviously very, very much available. And it's very, very much available in China, whereas China is importing most of its lithium, which it doesn't like. Um, so they're going to use as these electrode materials sodium ion. Uh, because it's more abundant and it's cheaper than lithium. Uh, they are, however, saying that these batteries, at least initially, will be more expensive than lithium ion because it's new, right? It's a new product. Therefore, it's always more expensive. Um, and um, yeah, lithium, 70% of the world's lithium is in South America. Uh, so it's not, for China particularly, that's a pretty long distance. It's about as far away as you can get from, from China. And they're saying the scarcity of resources and higher costs have led to a ceiling for large-scale industrial development. Um, and it's worth noting, however, that the current energy density of sodium ion batteries can only reach 120 watt hours per kilogram and lithium uh, can uh, go up to about 350 watt hours per kilogram. So this is not the killer for lithium uh, today or tomorrow, although lithium prices have come down ever so slightly. I saw that also today. Um, which surprised me because lithium prices have literally, but that would have been one of the best things you could have invested into. Uh, they have uh, doubled, well, I mean, short of short of crypto, obviously, uh, but they've, they've gone up from 40,000 at the beginning of the year to 89,000, 90,000, and now they're back down at 89,000. Uh, that is in Chinese renminbi per ton because China is pretty much the biggest lithium buyer out there. So, it is interesting in the sense that there might be competition for lithium some, somewhere down the road, but I don't think it is going to impact lithium supplies or miners in the near term. It's going to take them a little bit of time to basically get that up to scale and then to build them up from the density, you know, have to triple the density as well. So maybe you start seeing them in some of the, the lower end batteries in China, maybe in some of the mini EVs and, and bikes and those kind of things. But I think you are not going to see these in a NEO, uh, at least for, for a couple of years. Um, CH says, do you have a swing day trade, Felix? Sometimes. Um, one of my favorites is QQQ because I think it's one of the easiest things to read. Um, and I'll, I'll show you my theory on that. Um, now, a little bit the problem is I have is I, I don't like to sell things. <laughs> That's a little bit of a, of a problem. I like to buy things. So, so my, my swinging sometimes is I, I intend to, but I, but I don't always. So uh, every time it drop, dips below the 100-day moving average line, I like to, I like to buy QQQ. Uh, and that's been a very, very profitable trade for absolutely ages because I uh, go back in time, you know, and I go back a couple of years, and you can see that we very rarely actually... Well, not rarely, it, really, it happens frequently, but it always is quite profitable. So you're simply buying at each one of these uh, little dips here below that pink line each time you buy it, and therefore you're buying it much, much cheaper than if you bought it sort of on the average up there. Um, if you were really, um, really wanting to go for the dips, you'd only buy below the 200-day line, but then you'd only buy a sort of every every six months or something, which isn't really my style. Uh, but yeah, for me, that's that's kind of one. Uh, for the exit, there are obviously plenty of strategies uh, that you, you could apply to that. Um, you could simply set a fixed amount, a fixed percentage amount that gets you out. Uh, and and a, a, an interesting way of looking at it, you, you literally just look back in recent history, say you would have bought down here 269, uh, you know, you know, it went up to 298. So that is uh, 30. That's about 8% or so. So say, you know, you, you sell out when it goes up 5% or you know, even, even a little bit less or a little bit more, depending on how bullish you are. Um, I, 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 used to, I used to sell this all the time. Now I just buy it and I keep holding it because 
<laughs> I'd rather hold it uh, and I don't have any real urgency just to sell it but I think that's actually one that is is a fairly easy one to do now of course the market can can swing against you which is 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 a possibility um in which case i mean uh, look at the uh, the growth trajectory of this thing going back um, I, I don't really mind the risk of holding it uh, i'll just wait it out so i think that's probably one of the the clearest and and simplest things that you can uh, sort of trade on one really simple indicator 100 day moving average line um and sort of dip into and again i i teach you that kind of stuff and actually little you know Understanding technical analysis is kind of key for sw for, for swing trading uh, and not just the basics, but really the fundamentals in my course, guys. So check out the coupon code below. The coupon is FREEDOM. It gives you 39% off. Uh, and it's a fantastic course, not just technical analysis, but everything about valuations, how to make your discounted cash flow models, how to uh, trade in times of inflation, how to understand the economics and news and, and everything else. So check it out, guys. The link is below. Um, actually, if you don't have it, um, it's felixandfriends.org forward slash stocks. Um, and that coupon will expire on the 23rd of May. So jump in on that. Um, let me go through some more questions here. Uh, Muscle Dog, uh, great to have you on the call. As always, one of our lovely members, it, is it best to buy the stock before or after the split? Uh, you're talking about NVIDIA there. You know what? I don't think it makes a huge difference. Uh, basically, if you buy now, uh, what will happen in your brokerage, you'll get a, a, a sort of corporate um, uh, event uh, popping up in your inbox and you will suddenly have uh, four times the amount of NVIDIA stock at you know, a quarter of the price. So it may make absolutely no difference to you. There won't be a fee for it. It, it won't really affect you in any way, shape or form. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it really matters. Um, Nvidia today up very, very nicely, 3.3% uh, really flying off there. Now earnings are coming out for them on the 26th of May. Um, what's our expectation here? Expected to see upside in Q1 earnings owing to crypto and gaming or by curb by supply constraints which are likely to continue till year end um they're saying that the uh, first half of 2022 also provides additional strategic upside optionality amid regulatory hurdles uh consensus for the call is this here three dollars 28 earnings per share um Oppenheim noted automotive is the next major growth pillar and pretty much every EV company we've listened to on earnings and, and product presentations these last six months have said, we're going to put NVIDIA in there. NVIDIA, yes, and NVIDIA. It's, you know, it's NEO, it's XPeng, it's absolutely everybody. Um, and apparently Mercedes is also going to use them. Everybody is going to need these kind of powerful chips and NVIDIA there are, are kind of the market leader. So uh, I think there is a, a, a lot of legs left in on this. Um, though... Um, I obviously would prefer to buy it below the 100 day moving average line, but uh, that's kind of uh, gone out of the window. So they're going to if they're going to give us good numbers, they're going to give us uh, what I'd watch out for for, for that uh, muscle lock is how are they going to how they're handling the supply shortage? Is that a pricing pressure? Is it a margin pressure for them? If not, if they can simply pass the cost on to their consumers, and I suspect they can because they have a pretty good brand power them for them, then then they just don't care. And in, in effect, it probably makes it possible for them to charge more and incre improve their margins. But I definitely li listen in on that earnings call. Um, Michael uh, Kotschia there, I have also forgotten your, your Palantir, haven't I? Uh, so let's look at your Palantir question and then I'll, I'll talk about NEO. Uh, so we're looking at the um, uh, Palantir uh, stock here. So uh, the, the slight concern I had with this sort of mini rally, right? So we have kind of, you know, a, a nice trajectory here in general is that the volume trajectory is exactly the opposite. So our volume is going down as we're going up. And that means that the momentum is declining the higher we go. Uh, and therefore, this rally is unlikely to last. That's what, what the vo volume tells us. And if you pull up any number of um, indicators here, say momentum, um, it, it also shows you, if it does show you anything at all, um, at the moment, trading view not uh, being particularly fond of this momentum indicator let's try it again shall we nope still not all right how about another one okay i think trading view is having here okay there we are there we are there we are so we are getting here 
momentum improvements that are quite substantial. Let me make this a little bit brighter in terms of color. And I'll magnify that for you. So you can see, you see the momentum, it goes from dark red to now a sort of greenish red. So it's, it's improving a little bit, uh, but it's still not like, you know, it's not a, not a bright green, but it, it, it is getting there. So momentum is definitely improving here. Um, Williams R gave us a buy signal on the 17th of May, which was here, which wasn't a bad call. I mean, I was at 19.63, we're now at $21, and it continues to move us upwards here. Right. Uh, my concern is, though, that the volume is so very, very low uh, because, you know, relatively speaking, people are just not buying in on this particularly greatly. And then the one red day we did have a little bit, the volume was actually a little bit bigger than the previous day. Uh, so to me, I am quite a fan of looking at volume in terms of market indicator. Uh, so really what I want to see to really turn Palantir around uh, and I'm, I'm I'm hanging on which with my stock here is that we need to get through these peaks so we had uh, basically three bits of bad news here with these peaks that black one here this one and that one and we need to get to those levels and that's why I put in um, we need to get to well first of all the bottom of of this peak here and that's the 2110 uh, the 24 25 is is this level here uh, and then 2610 would be would be that one there and those are kind of the key resistance points we need to need to get through and at the moment we just don't know whether we're going to not just going to go to 2150 and then sort of fizzle off again um, and what could make that happen I don't think Palantir has got any bad news. I think they've really only got good news, uh, good numbers, great quarter, great software, great new clients, and a pipeline that's apparently brimming full. Um, and I, I love the stock. I'm super bullish on it long term. But uh, next week again, you know, if we get a job number that's slightly better than expected, then the whole inflation thing starts again, and then inflation sensitive stocks like Palantir will get hit again. So at the moment, I think. Some of the indicators are saying, yes, it's good, it's improving. I'm happy to see that. But as the volume is not really improving with it, I'm a little bit cautious uh, on jumping in on, on, on it at this particular price point. Uh, Nicholas Camps, great to have you on the call here as well. Uh, I'm sure you just heard what I said about Palantir. Uh, we can definitely look at, uh, at JD. Um, SOS, uh, Mohammed, is it a long-term investment? Uh, well... I don't know. Uh, some to me, honestly, something that looks like this, where my uh, my um, the trend is that, right? I, I, I it's, it's not for me because why why am I buying one hundred percent against the trend? Are they massively profitable? Have they are they curing cancer next year? Do they have the biggest free cash flow in the world? No, none of those things apply. So therefore, like with Alibaba, okay, here's a hugely profitable value business with great growth that's being hit. I totally get that. Uh, I, therefore, I'm buying it. SOS, mm, not really, uh, not for me. I'm not saying it's not for you, but it's 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 not for me. Um. Squarespace is going public, says Brian. There, can they compete with Shopify? So Squarespace, I've used Squarespace myself. It's it's a good platform. It's pretty easy to use. I'd say their competitor is more like it's probably more Wix, W I X, uh, not the volatility index. Um, can they compete with Shopify? I don't know. Uh, to be honest with you. Um, I think a lot of people who have Squarespace sites, because that's kind of the thing is they're quite sticky, right? Once you have a WordPress site or Squarespace site or a Vix site or a Shopify, you know, Shopify shop, to move out of it is such a pain in the neck that you don't. And that's kind of where they have stickiness. So if somebody has to come along and do it for free or do it 10 times better for you to move. So uh, therefore, I think they're existing customers and they do pay, they have to pay. Um, they are likely quite sticky. Um, in fact, I actually have some old Squarespace sites. I'm not a huge fan of it myself. I prefer something like WordPress because it's more open. I can throw everything out at it. Whereas Squarespace, it's, it's a more narrow niche platform. 
but it requires less tech knowledge. It requires less, um, you know, IT spend in a way. You could basically do it yourself. Um, I've created uh, for businesses an entire uh, business website with absolutely everything bells and whistles on Squarespace in about 10, 12 hours in one day. So it's a great platform from, from that sense. Shopify also is a super easy to set up business with a lot of options and a lot of plugins and a lot of a great ecosystem around it. So I think there is always space for a competitor. Uh, and if they can hitch on to the Shopify success, then you know, that, that, that can be a good story. Um, often being number two is just something people want to buy. They think uh, maybe they are going to get, you know, this kind of experience. How much has this gone up by? 200 um, since last year or so, or since it listed, it's up 4,670%. So that's the IPO story right there, right? So pe people will buy into that. Um, uh, Eletherios, uh, good of you to join us. Any news on Alibaba? It's dropping today. We just looked at, at the, the chart here, actually. It, it was down in Hong Kong today, about 2% or so, so it's not ex exactly surprising. Uh, there is no momentum, there is no oomph in this uh, stock at the moment. People are just looking at the negatives, which actually makes it a great buy opportunity. But you have to be very, very, very patient. Uh, that would be my, uh, my view on that. Mm. Uh, so Sophie or Sophie, uh, they have a great investor page on their website showing seven consecutive quarters of growth going public at the end of May. Shrewdest Joe. I haven't looked into the numbers, to be honest with you. Interesting, but I haven't looked into the numbers in any de detail, Shrewdest Joe. Uh, post it over on the Discord. I think we could definitely look at that. Um, growth is looking good, says Master Doc there. I'm definitely looking forward to Felix's opinion as well. Okay, thanks, guys. I'll make a note of that as well. Uh, I think that is an interesting one. Did anybody uh, watch the Oatly uh, IPO? <laughs> Anyone interested in vegan milk? Um, crypto is diving again. Let's have a look here. Okay, Bitcoin is below 38,000 again. Uh, let's have a quick look at that, and then shall we? BTC, USD. Um... That's the percentage scale. It's not what we're looking for. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So let's look on this on, say, uh, an hourly basis because Bitcoin is insane the way it trades. Uh, so it's trending downwards here pretty significantly. You can see the moving average lines above, right? But really what we are more interested in is actually this area here. So what we are interested in is this uh, are we going lower than we have been? So our low in the last uh, four hours was here at 38.315. And at the moment, we are still above that. And that is a slightly higher low than the one we had at 12 o'clock. So that is a positive, uh, if, if you will. And if you look at the previous lows, you know, you connect those, you actually do see a positive uh, momentum here um happening so I, I must say i'm pretty chilled about my my bitcoin uh, and, and what's going on with that um, you can if you like uh draw a um if you can draw uh, apparently i cannot uh let me go there so you, you get a nice sort of little triangle pattern here we you know from any of these um okay let me hide these guys let, give me a line, you know, you, you get this sort of a pattern here. So uh, it kind of forces us uh, out of this. Of course, it'd be lovely if we break out of this above into the 41,000s again, which we did earlier today. We had 4173. And you can kind of see that that trend line down was also our resistance, right? So uh, not just the... Um, 100-day uh, moving average line here, the, the pink one, but also actually that sort of triangle pattern. Uh, and at the moment, it also is holding holding at the bottom. So it depends on which way we break out of it. Uh, that gives us the next imminent uh, movement here. But, you know, as I say, Bitcoin, massively volatile. I think most people who are in this it, uh, understand and appreciate the volatility of this and are not particularly phased by it because um, you know, what did Kathy say uh, yesterday or, or this morning? It's, she thinks it's going to go to 500,000. So I think there are a lot of long-term holders in this. Um, it is just a bit of a, you know, 30% in, in, in Bitcoin land is, is, is nothing uh, unexpected. I think 70%, you know, movements up and down are entirely possible. And I think people have to bear that in mind uh, when, when they trade it. They need to be ready for that. Um, 
Uh, Master Doc, you love your oat milk with my latte is flax milk or oat milk is the only type I use. Um, yes, me too. I actually, yes, probably mainly, I used to use soy and I've moved on to um, oat almond also as well, I quite like, but oat milk flax milk and their products are good. I, I, I do really think that they are good. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how that uh, IPO does. Uh, Kai Tong is saying, saying okay, thank you for the Go EV recommendation. I'm not sure it was really a recommendation, uh, Kai Tong, but I appreciate you watching the video. I did the video, guys, if you missed it, on uh, exceptionally high short interest in, uh, in, in certain EV stocks, and Go EV is one of those. Um, um, Jonathan Wong, you're saying, yes, Palantir being added to QQQ, that is the rumor uh, that they might be added to... Um, to that, uh, which um, would be very, very good, of course. It would be mean e ETFs and tracker funds would have to buy the stock. Uh, so you want to be included in as many indices as possible. Um, that happens, uh, let me see, feed sheet here with all the, the dates uh, of when they, they rejig that. Um, let me have a look, when is the next one? Uh, Nasdaq announcements deletions. Uh, there was actually I can't see it here immediately. There is one at the end of the year on the 10th of December. I'm not sure if there's one before that, uh, but I'll, I'll, have, I'll have a bit of a dig uh, ferret around in that uh, and see if I can find uh, that news. Um, but thanks for, for shouting it out, Jonathan. Uh, IPOEs, you're saying? Is it this what you're talking about? Uh, day chart. Okay. I don't know a great deal about this. We obviously done some technical analysis on this, otherwise it wouldn't be on here. It is kind of breaking out. You're saying it's got huge uh, short interest to you. Uh, let's have a quick look if that is correct. Uh, one of the easiest places I find to look that up is Finvis. Uh, and you just type the uh, ticker at the end of the, you know, just type that in here and then you see short float 42% crikey yes absolutely that is that is pretty staggering um, you know if you compare that to say um, you know GME uh, GME is 20%, so it's double the shorted of uh, of GameStop. So yeah, absolutely insane. Uh, yet the stock is rising, so that is a potential short squeeze. Absolutely, uh, if that continues, uh, you might see one of those massive spike days like what we had here on the 7th of January. So entirely possible and also entirely speculative. Um, future A to B. Um, uh, Shooters Joe, okay, you've, you've said you've posted uh, in our fintech group here the link to uh, the SoFi thing. Uh, great, thank you very much. I will definitely have a look at that um, in uh, uh, after our call here, guys. And if you want to get that information analysis, the only way to get there, guys, is through the Patreon link below uh, and above uh, in, in, in all directions, in fact. Future A to B, any indication when Neo, Xpang and Lee are entering Hong Kong stock market listing? So the rumor is that Neo will list in August and they'll be the first one because it's easiest for them. Um, but we haven't got dates yet. Uh, Hong Kong just tightens its, uh, the listing rules for the main board a little bit, a little bit. And that's perhaps also why these listings are taking a little bit longer because normally Hong Kong is very fast. Uh, so they've made it a little bit harder. You need to, if you want to be on the main board, you need to actually have a profitability. So they'll be on the, on the tech board, I guess. guess. Um, is there a copy of that paper a calendar in the Discord? Says Bob. Uh, Bob is a good idea. I'll post that. Uh, the um, it's it's actually somewhere from the Nasdaq side, but I'll I'll post it for you. Uh, Nasdaq um, calendar. Um, I'll put that onto the 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 Discord. Maybe we we'll make a little group for sort of resources or something. I think it might be a good idea. Um, Aaron is saying there was a lot, I read an article yesterday saying that there are a lot of sell orders for Palantir at 2125. How would they know that? Um, Aaron, they're probably, they wouldn't really know that, I think. Uh, well, I mean, you can see, 
I, mean, I think they're probably looking at options. I think that's probably what they're looking at and they're, they're drawing conclusions from that. There are a lot of articles out that are sort of automatically generated by websites to get traffic. Uh, and they like to look at options numbers because the algorithms can read those option numbers and write up sort of sometimes accurate, sometimes slightly nonsensical articles. Um, um, can you review covered call and cash covered put options for new and analyzing says uh, Ryan Rayner there. All right, I will guys, I will definitely be doing um, a vid for tomorrow on Neo and we can look at uh, some of the uh, options uh, as well in that. So guys, make sure you're subscribed, otherwise you'll miss out on it. And we can also smash a record this weekend by hitting 20,000 subscribers. It would make me very happy. Um, uh, Alejandro is asking about call and put options. Are they looking good for Neo and Palantir? Are these good indicators for trends? I think they are good indicators for short-term trends. So I did a video a couple of days ago and we looked at the Neo uh, puts and there were very, very few. Volume had dropped out of that uh, market completely, uh, whereas there were a lot more um, you know, positive uh, call options. So yes, I think it can be part of gathering momentum and sort of what's going on. But I think really, if you want to understand how to read momentum and how to read the market, I, uh, you need to look at some of the momentum indicators. You need to look at a little bit of the macroeconomics. You need to look at a lot of things, what's happening to the stock uh, and their numbers and understand everything. And again, that's of course something that I teach in my course, uh, which is at 39% discount uh, down below. So check out the link below. It's, uh, what's the link guys? It's um, Felix Friends. What's what's the link? Uh, let, let me. I'll, I'll post it here. That's probably the easiest thing. Um, FelixFriends.org uh, forward slash stocks. Uh, that's that's the course. So, so check that out if you want to get into that. Uh, Masterdoc, um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I read an article yesterday saying that there are a lot of sellers. Okay, we just looked at that. Thank you. Um, Roy is saying, do you think the markets will crash big style in the near future? Well, I think the Fed at the moment is binging to the tune of 300 billion US dollars a month in asset purchases, right? Now, most economists expect that to that they start some sort of tapering, which means they'll buy a little bit less each month um, and perhaps in Q3 this year, perhaps a little bit later. It'll depend on the economic numbers we get each each week, really, or each month. Um, when they do, the growth stocks will take a hit. They'll take a beating um, and the whole market might temporarily. And then I think the money will flow back perhaps into the value stocks on more inflation fears. And then we sort of go around in the circle, depending on how quickly they'll do it or how slowly they do it. Um, again, if they wait too long, they might have to do it more aggressively, which could actually be worse for markets. But I think what I've been saying since the beginning of the year is I think a healthy rotation into at least if putting fresh money into uh, some of the more you know, inflation uh, resistant stocks and the kind of stocks that do well in inflation makes a lot of sense. Uh, and actually, for that reason, guys, I added a whole chapter to um, my, my uh, stock course um, this week how to invest in during times of inflation and what stocks do well with inflation and which ones specifically to, to pick and also uh, which of the macroeconomic indicators that we get every week and that the media shout at us every single day, which ones actually matter in the long run for, for investing in stocks. So again, uh, check that out. Um, uh, Felix, Philip is saying, how would you split a fixed investment on Neo, Lee and Tesla? 33% on all, or what would you go for? Um, so if I had to make that decision, um, I think probably a 33% is not a bad move. Why? Because the Lee Auto one is a little bit more of a hedge because the valuations are a little bit lower, more conservative company. It's going to be profitable first compared to Neo. Uh, whereas Neo, I think building more long-term Apple-like brand, I think they're going to have fantastic growth in China and success. Tesla, of course, the market leader, the uh, international 
uh, grower, uh, though margins probably will be a little bit lower, but then you know you have you have probably faster growth as they're rolling out into so many markets, uh, though much, much higher capex burn as well. So I think there are dif differences. You've picked three stocks that are not entirely the same in, in terms of profile, uh, though if that was my whole portfolio, I'd be seriously worried because they do move very, very much together. Tesla moves the other two. So it doesn't give you short term diversification from volatility. But in the long run, you're picking uh, three rather different EV stocks. CH, you still want a studio tour? Well, I've, 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 I've put on an extra light today. The background's a little bit brighter, so you do see a little bit more CH. But we'll do that. I'll, 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 I will do something like that. I'll, at least I put it on the Discord, CH. Um, uh, Andre, why did you look into uh, Geely? Uh, I, I look into Geely all the time. Um, I'm a big fan. I think it's a great company. It makes everything from the whole range of, uh, of, of EV motors you could possibly make. Uh, what I'm most excited about with regards to Geely is that they own Volvo, which own Polestar, and that will IPO at some time in the near future. And, and I think for me, that's the, the real one there. Uh, but yes, Geely is very interesting, also partnering with lots of people, putting out lots of brands, uh, and they really have their fingers in absolutely everything, including 10% of Daimler, uh, they own all of Lotus, they own 50% of the London cabs. I mean, they're really... Uh, um, all, all over the place in a very, very good sense. So, uh, yeah, interesting company. Um, uh, Abhijit, you're taking what Palantir to join the QQQ, your thoughts? Yeah, that is indeed the rumor. We were just looking at that, when that might happen and why that might happen. And I will do some more deep diving on that. I think at this point, it's a rumor. It's it's possible. Uh, and of course, it would be good because lots of ETF and tracker fund money would flow into Palantir. Uh, but I'll, I'll do a video uh, on that, guys. I'll, I'll probably put that out by tomorrow. So make sure you're sub sub subscribed so you get that notification. Uh, Tesla, yeah, so there is a tweet or, or, or a message from Elon saying um, that he intends to or looking at Russia as an, as an option. Um, so there might, uh, it is a market and there is, of course, a lot of the sort of... Uh, um, you know, whatever the, I don't know what the politically correct term is, but all the uh, former Soviet Union countries and all of that, there is a big market there. Uh, so there is a good potential for that. You could also supply a lot of Europe from there. You could supply Asia from there. It depends on where they put it. And um, again, they might get some very favorable terms there. Um, Elon also said some interesting stuff today. Um, uh, after, you know, what did he say today? Where Where is Elon? Elon, 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 where did you go? Uh, he, he posted something more about, um, you know, Doge again today. So I was wondering if that's going to fly off the handle again. I, I can't seem to find it now. He posted here. How much is that Doge in the window? Um, Cyber Viking. I mean, more, it doesn't get much more cryptic than that, but 61,000 people have commented on it. 280,000 people have liked it. Um, so, you know, that's that's Elon for you. <laughs> so uh, what, are, what are cryptos doing here? Well, at least Bitcoin is getting hit uh, at the moment relatively painfully down 8% so, so far today, which is now a little bit lower than the last dip was. Uh, Philip, uh, let's let's move on to more difficult questions. I, 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 I like you, Philip. Let's let's crank up. Uh, the discussion and not share um, a lot of value stocks when we look at several of the banks they are at all-time highs um, yes i'm actually not buying banks um, i you know for me it's more um, something like microsoft for example um, i think there is very little uh, wrong that could, could go wrong with microsoft and yes it is growing it, it is at an all-time high uh, it is, you know, it keeps going up and up and up and up. But performance is not insane. Uh, if I look since the beginning of the year, yeah, it's up 16%, but then there's always a lot of the market. So it is not that crazy or something like uh, like a PayPal, for example. Uh, companies that I think are just benefiting, for example, that is, here we go, actually not at an all-time high at the moment. Um, so companies that are hugely profitable, great big margins, great growth, and are almost indispensable to their customers. Uh, so, I mean, most of us probably have a PayPal account. If we, if that was to get turned off, it'd be quite difficult for us to do the purchasing. I mean, at least it wouldn't be difficult, but it'd be tedious, wouldn't it? It's so easy now. You just click and that's it. And you're done, checked out, paid for. So, and the business on the other side feel the same way. They get money very, very easily. 
uh, and you know taking all sorts of payment options from all around the world you know, with one one click they really don't have to worry about it so i think there are stocks like that that i would perhaps prefer to a, a bank of america or something like that do you think money's going to move into gold philip is saying um I don't really see it. I mean, gold hasn't really gone anywhere in absolute ages. Um, do we have um, here gold out per ounce? Uh, yeah, it's recovering a little bit, but not really all that much. Put that into percentage terms. It, you know, since the beginning of the year when we sort of started to have our wobbles, we're up half a percent, uh, and it just hasn't really have performed in in during this kind of you know the sort of crisis that we had right it just hasn't uh, which is which is unusual uh, because generally speaking when you have these inflation panics it should it should do quite well and it, and it hasn't really so look at the you know when did inflation fears really kick off sort of january february uh, and we are up a percent so um, i i do hold a little bit of gold but um i i think crypto it's stealing its 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 mojo really i think that's what's happened here um shoeless joe yes there is a lot of speculation you're saying about uh tesla possibly building a factory in the uk um, and the uk government will probably be quite um you know welcome with open arms they're out of the eu now so they can offer more uh, tax incentive in more terms than they can when they're in it because the european union restricts you uh, what you can offer you can sort of unfavorably um unfairly in their view favor one company over another so i think they have an option there and i think yeah they're going to go for it and of course the uk is a big market for evs and um they could also supply it would yeah i i think you know why not they could ship it to a lot of places from there so it certainly supply a lot of europe uh, as well at the same time um uh, Alejandro, a great guy. You're going to join our Patreon. I look forward to seeing you over there. It also gives you access to our fantastic Discord community, which you I always pop it up. You see it every once in a while on my chats. We share a lot more information there than we can on these videos here. Uh, and as I say, it's a 24 hour community, so you can always ask me questions out there. And all of you uh, lovely patrons, you can, I think, testify to the fact that I answer all of your questions. Um, and I appreciate you tuning in, uh, Alejandro. Um, Arian is talking about Neo. Is it going to fill the gap again here? Well, I think today we are. My prediction was uh, beginning of the day we're going to get a Green Friday because we've had five Green Fridays in a row. So there's something in Fridays that make make people want to buy uh, Neo. Uh, are we going to go back down again? I think it's entirely possible. I think we are going to zigzag a little bit sideways here because we have a chip shortage and that's just going to affect the market. And if Tesla, for example, has a bit of a bad day, it's going to pull us down. Tesla here at zero at the moment um, on. Yeah, so we have to, you know, it is it is at the moment a bit of a fickle industry. Uh, it's the chips that will move us here. Chris is saying the market correction on growth stocks has gone on for three to four months. When do you think we're out of the woods anytime soon? Chris, unfortunately not, because if you look at the stance the Fed has taken, they're saying we're still throwing 300 billion US dollars a month at the market in asset purchases, which is a staggering amount. I mean, the headline figure is 130 billion, but if you look at all their reinvestments, it's actually more like 300 billion. And they're doing that because they're saying the inflation we're seeing isn't really real. It's temporary, transitory, whatever the word is they're using. And they are worried. They are worried. They are terrified, in my view, of deflation. And I think that's a very, very real threat. And if you get deflation, you become Japan. And Japan is lovely. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But you get into a taxi in Japan and it was built in 1978 because buying a new car is idiotic when it's cheaper next month and the month after and the month after that you're always going to put it off so you're going to put up all of your major purchases forever and that is not very good for an economy um you know why would you ever buy anything again people don't buy you know real estate the japanese most of them do not because they just think well property just loses money over time so it's a very very different way of looking at things in a very hard to get the economy back out of that. Um, now, they still have a fantastic quality of life and they're doing very well. It, so it doesn't necessarily affect that. But from a pure commerce point of view, it's a scary place to be. So therefore, I think they are going to let this 
economy run hotter and hotter. They're going to let the market continue to run up somewhat. And then every time we get a little bit of an inflationary macro item, and Chris, you are on my course, uh, you will, uh, you will uh, go through the macroeconomic lesson soon. And, you know, all of those little things can be indicators for possible inflation down the road. And every time that happens, the market's going to overreact and the market's going to panic. And then we're going to go back up a little bit. And then we're going to panic again because we get a lot of economic data out. Uh, and, um, you know, every time our job numbers are a little bit better than expected, every time... Um, commodity prices go up a little bit and they have actually gone down quite a lot in, in recent weeks but you know I think the market appreciates it's onto a good thing I mean I don't know if you were here at the beginning of the call uh, what I was saying is we are uh, you know we're basically in a bar with 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 a free tap uh, and we just keep getting free drinks and we're just enjoying them because they're free and the bartender saying this can't last it's going to get turned off at some point and we're like yeah but keep them coming keep them coming while it's well you know while they're still free but we realize that when he goes and he turns off uh, our free tap we realize what's going to happen to the, to the market so I do think growth stocks, therefore, are going to get uh, going to have some serious volatility, uh, and I think they're going to go lower, uh, absolutely, temporarily at least. So, super important to pick the good ones, and also to have a plan and the ability to continue to discount average into those positions uh, as things go down. And I, I would also say, you know, go, go put some money into into those uh, good stocks that would benefit from inflation. Um, do you think the Fab Four and EVs generally are very solid long term? Says so future A to B. So you're probably talking about Tesla, Neo, X, Pang, Li. Is that those are the Fab Fab Four? The Chinese press calls them um, the Three Musketeers, excluding Tesla, which is also quite a nice one. Uh, I think they are solid companies in the sense that they have very strong government backing, so they're very unlikely to go out of business. I, I would say. I think I think they will all still be here in in, in five or ten years time. Um. Kai Tom is saying uh, crypto is sterling gold's mojo. Absolutely, I'm with you on that. Jeff is saying the Ford F-150 Lightning, does that make the cyber truck a non-issue? No, no. I think it's good Ford is doing that. Um, I wouldn't buy a Ford stock um, if you gave it to me for free. <laughs> well, okay, I'd take it for free. Of course I would. But I just think, um, you know, look at... Um, what, what is it that I want to look at? Finvis? Is it Finvis? No, it's not Finvis. Uh, let me... Um, <laughs> sometimes. There's so, so many different websites that all sound very similar. Uh, look at Coifin. That, that's the one. So if you, if you look at, at Ford on this one, uh, let me just show you. No, we don't want SPY. Uh, why I wouldn't go near Ford. Uh, and that is... Um, financial analysis, income statement, uh, financial highlights. That's probably pretty good. So look at their revenue growth, right? This is from 2018 onwards. Here's a chart. So it's pretty volatile, right? It goes up and down and up and down. And obviously now last year, massively down. Now, gross profit has been kind of trending down the whole time. Um, net income margins are all over the place, irrespective of revenue absolutely growing. You know, I mean, revenue did really grow, right? So during that, at least it, it went up dramatically up to 20, the end of uh, 2019, 2020. So why is their income, net income margin all over the place? Uh, that scares me. I don't want to invest in stuff like that. Um, price to earnings, okay. It's rallying up for no particular reason. Look at the debt. This is the debt they've accumulated while their revenues were increasing and their margins were all over the place. So they are basically growing by spending more money that they don't have. Margins are erratic, unpredictable. Um, and yeah, I just don't get it. I, I, think it's, I think it's a business that will probably survive because the government won't let it fail. But uh, I, I really wouldn't go there. And if you look at, look at the stock chart at the same time, um, so we were just looking at this from 2018 was the chart we we're looking at. So let's pull it up from 2018. So you get a feel for uh, what was happening as their, uh, you know, their revenues, their revenue was basically doing something like this. And then obviously it fell off, right? That was their revenue. At the same time, the stock was absolutely collapsing. So if you bought this in October 2017, you would have paid $12.80 for it. It's now worth $12.39. So 
Uh, for me, it is one of those companies I do not understand why people hold these stocks. Uh, CH Coifin, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, that is Coifin is a good website actually. If if you want to have a look up a quick snapshot of anything, uh, so uh, let me throw the I'm going to throw you the link uh, down here. Uh, anyone who's interested, um, obviously that's the link now for the Ford one, but you can obviously change that. It's quite a good one. Um, Yon Shu is saying Ford has a lot of goodwill. Yes. And if they didn't, they would have closed. And they have goodwill and that's why they are around. But a company with erratic margins that are falling while revenues are growing uh, and debts that are massively increasing while revenues are growing, uh, I, it, it falls outside of my scope of good companies. And if you want to understand what a good company is, guys, I teach you that on my course. The coupon code down below is down below, 39% off. The coupon is freedom. Uh, and that's exactly the aim of it, build financial freedom. Uh, so I, I teach you exactly how to analyze a financial st statement here. We obviously looked at some real highlights here, but it's important to understand how to read an income statement and come to a reasonable conclusion from it. Super important to understand that if you want to invest in anything. Um, uh, does your course cover all this terminology uh, for financials um, uh, Chris e yes I would say so I think we we certainly look at uh, I, I know you're on the course Chris uh, we certainly cover um, how to read income statements uh, and, and things like that in, in, in quite a bit of detail uh, so once, once you get to that that lesson or that lecture Chris let me know if you have any questions uh, that's why we have a private chat group for our course members to have exactly those kind of questions uh, to spot uh, what to me is a dud and I, I don't mean to offend the fourth the brand of course it's a great old wonderful um, you know grandfather of a brand lovely and all that but it's just been horribly managed uh, otherwise how do you get this chart here revenue growth like that how do you get revenue like growth like that uh, and your debt where was my debt here it was on the highlights at the same time um, how does your debt do that when your revenue does that how does that make any sense um, it, it really just doesn't it, it's just terrible terrible man management um, Ford used to have a six percent dividend uh, yes when they still had money um, uh abijit is saying i'm a bit reluctant to top up near because of the hullabaloo regarding chinese that's a great word the kind of chinese adr delisting is it something i should be worried about well xiaomi isn't getting delisted right i, I think um is it xiaomi no it's it's huawei huawei right huawei isn't getting listed i think the chinese delisting thing is not a concern of mine to be honest with you uh, i don't think the u.s government and the u.s financial industry is going to allow regular companies like like neo uh, to get delisted and um, they might delist the purely 100 percent government owned sort of infrastructure kind of type companies energy companies things like that uh, although even the three telcos are in court in the us right so it kind of shows the beauty of the us legal system that you can actually fight this stuff so for me it's not a real really a concern uh, i think the concern i suppose is more is um you know do, do you think you can get it cheaper if you wait a little bit well it's it's a, it's a balancing act between inflationary fears and when will the chips kick in if Neo manages to get chips a little bit earlier than we expect, you're going to get a rally in that. So it's kind of a, you know, I think that's kind of what we are zigzagging up and down here between sort of uh, 31 and, you know, 34, 35, that kind of thing. Um, we might go a little bit higher. I would expect we could go maybe to 38, 39, and then we might come down a little bit again. But until we get chips, I, I wouldn't expect massive movement there. Um, Philip says, my finance is attached to my wife, so it has nothing to do with Freeman, unfortunately, Philip. You know what? I actually have a le lecture exactly on that because I do think investing and financial planning is something to do uh, together or actually separately in a way. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it is it is incredibly important if you are husband and wife or partners or whatever it is uh, to, to do that together. So yeah, I, I appreciate that, uh, <laughs> uh, Philip. Um Future A to B, are Ford and GM dead horses long term? Will they go bankrupt? You know what? I think they are bankrupt, but they won't let them go bankrupt because the government will always help them out. Uh, but I, you know, 
it's it's not for me i mean there are always companies that survive that continue with huge debt levels and somehow they continue uh, interest rates are, are virtually zero uh, and um, therefore they can continue and they can survive they can sell a lot of cars but does it make it a good long-term business for my criteria no uh, my criteria it doesn't fit the bill um and shoeless joe yes you you, you can draw a parallel there of course but neo it you can bail out companies. And uh, now NEO is debt free, uh, whereas Ford is laden up with debt. So it's a little bit of a different story. I think NEO ran out of money because they didn't raise enough at the IPO level point, right? And, and they knew that when, when the IPO happened, they were disappointed with the amount of money they raised there. Uh, and that wouldn't last because it's, it's a startup. Uh, so the government bailed them out and they made a ton of money out of it. So it was a successful bailout in that sense. Uh, but it isn't this sort of, historic dinosaur that needs to be fixed and no one's willing to fix it probably because of the the, the, the trade unions um Yeriel, can any stocks have 105 percent of shares held by institutions um i think that'd be difficult to achieve <laughs> Yeriel, maybe there are some numbers out there that don't make sense um uh, julio uh, there is absolutely you're absolutely right he says i wish i was better educated earlier on about investing better late than never you know what you and me both i think everybody feels the same way uh, but it isn't never too late uh, you can make a tremendous amount of money investing a small amount of money each month into good stocks and that's precisely what i teach in my course because i want people to have financial independence rather than just sort of go to the casino and like punt money at stocks hoping something will stick and they'll get lucky investing isn't really about getting lucky it's about having a proper strategy and proper criteria and 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 sadly most retail investors don't have that and that's why we see first hour of trading is retail investors they're acting on the news they read that morning the funds don't buy in the first hour of the morning uh, right they wait they wait for the opportunity and then they pounce um george is saying what are uh, this top five growth companies in your your opinion actually on our patreon we have a list of my top 10 growth stocks and top 10 value stocks and top 10 div stocks um i mean it really depends on how, how you define growth i think uh, there are a lot of companies that are growing very well that are still kind of value stocks as well i mean tencent for example i know they're uh, a little selling a little bit off after their great earnings i think for example that's a fantastic stock i think neo is actually a very good stock but it requires growth stocks require patience and people don't get that people think growth stocks give me 60 percent in three months they can if you're lucky if you are lucky that the herd is moving with you at that particular moment but the real money is made over the longer term and then yes perhaps trimming your positions at, at certain price levels and then buying more once it falls below below certain price points um what i think about altcoins um i i think it's it is of course gambling uh, and i'm guilty of it uh, as well uh, i think there are some coins that are very interesting um you know something like like ada or, or you know some of the other ones are very interesting uh, doge for example is a pure speculative play nothing wrong with that but it isn't you're not buying any kind of value at the moment now the success of it might create some sort of uh, utility is that's kind of the the, the interesting part about this space uh, but i think for me and i come from an equity background um you know i used to work for an investment bank here for a little while uh, i would never put a substantial part of my portfolio in, in into this now it's growing quite nicely so say when i bought ethereum it went up three times four times uh, i sell off my original investment i get my money back uh, and i put it into my 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 core stocks uh, and now i have you know three times the amount of money i put into ethereum uh, for free so if, see there, there are ways of mitigating your risks rather than just sitting there you know that lovely chap Do the, the uh, dogecoin millionaire guys super uh, nice guy but i wish he would have just sold out some of his money and put it into something that would give him a virtually guaranteed return and give him financial independence because he could have done that and you could still have had a massive bet on on doge and that's what they are they're bets right so uh, 
fine to do bets, but you need to be in a financial position to have had your original portfolio sorted in an order to be able to do that. At least that's that's my take on it. Otherwise, you are you're just gambling, and you know, which it's it, it's fine to gamble. It's legal, uh, but it isn't going to give you any particularly um, guaranteed uh, return. Um, Team Michael Barry or Kathy Woods, uh, Philip? I love your questions, Philip. Um, I wouldn't discount Michael Barry. I think he is a very smart man. Um, and he doesn't buy or short stocks, for example. The Tesla short, he doesn't do that out of a conviction that Tesla is a terrible company. I think that's misinterpreted. He sees an opportunity where, where you know, the market does this. I mean, in terms of percentage, it was, you know, absolutely insane, right? Uh, what, what, what Tesla's done, you know, it went up 1,600%. And he knows that people will worry about inflation because we were talking about that at the beginning of the year and he knows it's coming. So he's very smart. He puts a short on the one thing that has gone up uh, more than most and is at, you know, valued at incredibly high um, valuation multiples and will therefore get hit. He knows it when inflation is coming. So, you know, the, the more conservative investor just sold a little bit of Tesla and put it into PayPal or Microsoft or something or, uh, you know, Bank of America. He makes a big bet on that and, and, you know, he would have made billions and he would have made an absolute killing on that. So it's a very smart short term move and, and, and he does quite a lot of that. He also invests, you know, a lot of long term stuff. He buys a lot of, um, you know, U.S. farmland and things like that. So he isn't your pure speculator. Uh, and I think that's always important to understand is to balance one's portfolio. If you've got a great portfolio, that's performing in the long run you maybe have some real estate with great yields you have other things you have great incomes passive incomes pouring in and then you can take uh, great big bets like that that are based on logic and fundamentals and that's a much much smarter thing to do than just to run after the latest headline of something that might go up 10x right so um, kathy is uh, obviously super smart uh, they are i think i would say um they like to invest against the trend um, in, in, into there, what she always, she's, I think she's pretty much termed this term conviction stock, right? Which people are misinterpreting. People are often saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm convicted. This is my conviction stock, whatever it is. They can't really tell you why they just like picked something like a football team and they are now sticking with it till, you know, death do us part. And that isn't really a smart strategy either. Uh, you can, if you've done your research, think, well, this company is fundamentally really solid. It's going to do incredibly well. They've got some great tech that's just better than everybody else. And the backers are these and these are the reasons. Uh, and so therefore, I'm, I'm going to hold on to this uh, for, say, a five year time horizon. Now, but you have to write down what those things are so that when you when things, something changes, you know what to do, because if something changes, you either need to buy more or you need to sell some off. So um, I think um, Kathy are doing that and ARC are doing that. It's just a lot of people who are mimicking and copying some of those stocks are not doing that. And I think a lot of those people would simply be better to buy a bit of ARC K. Um, um, well, Lee talking about Airbnb and Coinbase. Okay, let's touch on that. Uh, Chris, um, one of our lovely admins here. Chris, you haven't had to kick anybody out today. Isn't that a shame? People say, I don't invest in investment products based on previous returns, but I disagree. If they have good returns in the past, they have shown they can pick good companies. Do you agree, disagree? I think it depends on the time horizon, Chris. I think a lot of people pick an investment advisor or fund manager on what they did in the last 12 months. And you, what you really need to look at is a longer period of time and you need to look at what did they do in bad markets. And that's, I think, one of the, the core tests is and how do they come out of the bad market? So it, is, it was very easy for any fund manager to make a lot of money in the last 12 months. I mean, virtually everything has gone up. So everyone was a genius. Doesn't mean everyone's a genius. Uh, the problem with looking at recent performance data is... If you look at the fund inflow outflow, the most money flows into the top 10% funds that performed the best in the last 12 months. The outflows out of the 10 worst performing stocks is minimal. There's almost none. So the problem is with our psychology is that we hang on to the losers. Uh, so 
I, I would look at past performance always with a great deal of caution, especially if it's a new fund or a new manager. Look at them over a longer period of time. You can't really judge somebody by uh, a good performance in a bull market. They could have just been lucky. They really could have just been lucky. I mean, Kathy might be a genius or she might have just been lucky for picking Tesla. Um, we don't really know yet. Uh, Mohammed, uh, I, I agree with you there on Ford and strong, highly unionized companies are a little bit of, of, a, of, a, of a difficult one to invest in. Julio, thank you very much uh, for the great information. Uh, there is lots more in my course, guys, and tons of tons of lectures over there. And of course, the course also continues to expand. So check out my coupon code down below, 39% off. It is freedom, uh, as in fat, fat, wonderful financial freedom. Um, Uh, Bailey Gifford, uh, Chris, you're absolutely right. Yes, they have picked very, very well in the long run. And again, they are long-term investors, and I like that. And I quite like that about ARK as well, that they don't jump out of things when they underperform. In fact, they buy more of it because it kind of makes sense. You're getting it cheaper, the same thing, right? Um, though ARK's portfolio is particularly risky because it's kind of all in the future, right? So I think there is space for part of that in one's portfolio, but 100% ARK portfolio, to me personally, uh, would, would scare me. Um, SMT. Okay, hang on. Let's have a quick look at that. Um, I actually haven't looked at their shares. I only ever looked at their funds. Uh, but what has been their performance over time? Pretty good, I would have thought. So say since 2014, 533% up. Uh, that's not bad. So let's compare that to, say, SPY. Yeah, so they've substantially overperformed that. I guess QQQ might be a more... Uh, um, 327%. I mean, this is a random time period I picked here, literally. I don't know how far back we can go. So yeah, but they have... Let's make that a monthly chart, see if we can go back any further. We can go back to 1996. So you can see there, they have solidly outperformed even the QQQ, which has done uh, tremendously in that time period. So yeah, I think I think they are they are good guys. Now, if you buy it up here, mm, right, you're you're not exactly getting it cheaply. That's the only problem with that, isn't it? So if I wanted to get into that, uh, Chris, I would get into that slowly and steadily. I wouldn't throw, say, at £10,000, I wouldn't throw it all at Scottish Mortgage in one go. I would sort of ease into that because uh, I think there is a chance uh, that they uh, might, might come down a little bit with these inflation fears. Um, Shulis is saying, what's the maximum percentage of your portfolio you invest in one stock or sector? Do you have any hard rules? I would normally not buy more than, say, 5% of one stock. Um, but I wouldn't sell it if it continued to perform well. So um, therefore, it could really, really run up. So for me, for example, PayPal is, is maybe, I don't know, 8% or something of my portfolio. It's a pretty sizable part just because it's done so very well. I'm not going to get rid of it because I think it's a great company and I think they're actually better now than when I bought it first. I, I'll actually buy it every month. So I therefore haven't got that sort of hard and fast rule. Um, now, would I have a 25% of my portfolio in, say, EVs or biotechs or something? No, probably not. Um, I, I think uh, that might expose me. Though, if you look at the definition of sectors, sometimes they can be misleading. So tech, for example, could include Facebook, Microsoft, PayPal, and, uh, you know, Square, right? Uh, or, uh, you know, there's so many tech companies. Um, and I think then you have to kind of make a differentiating uh, factor between what is really sort of high risk, high growth tech and what is, um, you know, value kind of core, um, reliable tech, if, if I can call it that. So uh, it depends a little bit, again, how you divvy that up. But diversification is is an art. Um, and again, of course, I have lectures on that, guys, on my course. Uh, because it's super important, but it can also be overdone. So I'm also not a fan of a portfolio with hundreds and hundreds of stocks because you can't keep track of it. There's no way you can keep hold of that. So if you just don't want to do the homework, you don't want to put in the time to look at some stocks just by an index, 
You can buy QQQ, right? Or you can buy Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust. That's pretty much an index. Uh, or you find a good fund manager with very, very low fees uh, and you leave it at that and you're just like, oh, whatever, that's all I'm ever going to do. And that's a totally fair strategy. Or you do that and then you pick uh, maybe the one sector you know something about. And that's always something I say to people is if you have some inherent knowledge about an industry from your job or your qualifications, um, look into that sector because you actually know something about that. Mm. Uh, Chris, you're talking about um, premium over net asset value. So funds or ETFs often trade slightly above or sometimes slightly below the net asset value. So net asset value basically is the share price of all those shares they're holding. Uh, there are differentiators. There's a, there's a difference between those sometimes. Typically, it's pretty minimal, uh, but you do you want to keep an eye on it that it doesn't get too big? You'd, otherwise, you start to pay a premium uh, for the kind of brand or fund you're buying into, in which case uh, I, I would rather buy the underlying stocks. But typically, with most funds nowadays, they're so liquid and trade so frequently, uh, the, the amounts are, are pretty minimal. Now, if you can, of course, buy something at a discount to its its NAV, uh, then that's interesting again. And, you know, a lot of people do that through holding companies. Um, do you think we've bottomed already or is it a bull trap, says Pedro here? I'm feeling a little bit is that let's have a look at what the market's doing it today that these green Fridays that we see pretty much every week. Um, I mean, today is sort of green, isn't it? It's not that green, but it might get a little bit greener. They tend to be a little bit of a bull trap moment. They get us into an exuberant mood for Monday. We buy a little bit on uh, Monday, Tuesday. We go down on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we are we are back up for our next shot on Friday. So I don't think we've had a fundamental change out of the growth um, as stock era and the inflation concerns are still very, very much there. So I'd be a little bit cautious at the moment with piling tons of money into growth stocks for anybody who has a shortish term horizon. Um, uh, Stefan is saying a lot of undervalued, especially Barber, PDD, JD. Yes, I think there are buying opportunities. Absolutely, I think there are. Um, uh, Vincent is saying, why is the NASDAQ down? Well, it's basically inflation fears. Uh, and it's just, this hasn't gone away and this isn't going to go away. We're going to talk about this for the next six months. Uh, it's it's going to get annoying, <laughs> but it'll, it'll still be the topic. So um, if you look at the NASDAQ, you know, it, it tends to trade, I'm on percentage scales here. It, it tends to trade in these sort of, um, you know, these kind of loops, right? It's sort of, it, it always seems to do these kind of funny little loop performances and at the same time your volume does the opposite each time it's kind of a funny one so you get you know you go up like that and then your volume does the opposite it's sort of a kind of bizarre uh, you get the most volume of the nasdaq when the market falls which is a little bit strange it's the opposite of what most stocks do but but there we are so we are at the moment you know we are going up again but i do expect another one of these loops i think it won't be any different uh, and if you look at um yeah so it's just inflation worries. Inflation basically reduces the present value of the future earnings of growth stocks. And growth stocks are valued on the basis of future earnings. So um, that's basically the basis of that. Um, uh, Howard, uh, welcome to the chat. I haven't seen you on here earlier. Great of you to join. Are you saying, I was advised any more than 10 stocks was too many, ideally six or seven to do proper DD. Uh, I think I think any more than that, it becomes quite challenging. I, I'm totally with you, uh, which is why I'm actually quite a fan of buying, say, ETFs or a, a fund from a fund manager I trust. And then I buy the individual stocks that I particularly want to look into because try digging into 20 or 30 stocks. It's pretty hard work. Um, it just going through all of that, you know, 30 earnings calls a month. Right. Uh, that already is 45 hours that's a week gone uh, you know what i mean reading the financial statement that's another 40 hours for you so uh, you know it, it, it gets quite challenging so i, I agree with you there actually the, the the less you do is often better um and if you then want to diversify out of that because say say howard you work in the it space and therefore you buy four or five or three it stocks that you really understand then you're 100% in IT. You don't even want to do that. So you then want to diversify out of that. So, you know, you buy the SPY. 
nothing wrong with that. It'll still give you a return of maybe, you know, 9% a year or something on average. So uh, nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, Dia didn't get it, Jeff. Thank you very much. Dia had fantastic earnings uh, out. Absolutely. Uh, very, very good numbers there. Um, Philip's going to go make some pizza. Uh, FR8 is saying Baba is basically a get rich slow stock in your opinion should noobs buy it okay it isn't without risk right because we have a lot of regulatory hangover now it's cheapest chips in my view um, but it could be that we see no ant IPO this year maybe we see no ant IPO next year then is Baba just going to hang around 210 215 220 in which case you have an opportunity cost, right? You could have bought, say, the QQQ continues to perform at, you know, say 10, 11%. Then you could have bought that and you would have been 20% better off. So that is the, that's the, the only risk with it, I, in my view. The, the numbers, the business, the growth, I think that's all stellar. So for me, it's, 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 I, I have a position in it, um, but I also know that the growth that has to come will have to be so much greater for it, for, you give me that return, right? If it goes up 50%, but in the last, you know, six months, I've it hasn't done anything. If it continues to do nothing for the year and then next year it goes up 50%, then that's only 25% per year. That's still very good. But you have to factor in the time factor here. That, that's all I would say. Um, is 20% return a year an achievable target, Chris is saying? It's an ambitious one, I, I would say to you. I... I um, and Chris, you will you will see that because you are you are you are on my course. Um, my, I aim for eleven percent a year, and I typically uh, been getting fifteen percent plus. Uh, but it is, of course, also we have been very very fortunate. We have been in a very very good um, you know market cycle for many many years. So um, I'm happy with my 11 percent, and I think I can get that without taking uh, substantial risks. Um, some people will still say to you maybe eight or nine percent or something is, is 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 more guaranteed and perhaps that's right but i think given the world we are in of money printing and all that stuff uh, and um I, I i think you can get a double digit figure uh, quite comfortably i think when you aim for the 20 percent, the reason i don't do that is because i think it encourages you to take risks that are perhaps greater than what you should so i'd rather aim for the 11 and get my 15 or 18 or sometimes 20 sometimes more uh, but i'm not upset if i'm getting getting 10 or 12 you, you, you know what i mean chris um john cooper is saying nearly june and nasdaq is flat this is manipulation I, I I wouldn't see it like that, uh, John. I think you have to take into account where we've come from, and that is last March we were at the QQQ at 236. Now we are at 340. So in percentage terms, uh, let me ask a little friend here. Uh, we are up 38% uh, pretty much year on year. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty good return over the year. I, I know we've gotten used to, you know, triple digit returns and this sort of thing, but in the long run, uh, the market doesn't really give you that. Um, uh, yeah, and, and Chris, you're right. You know, if you got 28% last year in funds, absolutely, that's fantastic. That's wonderful. But you have to appreciate the moment we were in, right? You know, the Fed added 20% extra cash to the world. So, you know, it's causing that. It, you know, you've, you've done incredibly well, Chris, but it doesn't mean that you are forever in eternity going to get your 28%. Uh, I just think those targets become a little bit, uh, well, they invite a lot of risk, uh, which uh, I, I, I'm personally not, not willing to take. I, I'd rather have, because if you compound it, and, you know, again, you, 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 you've watched my, my compounding lectures in our, our course, um, 
you know, you, you understand the power of that. So a slightly lower risk strategy with compounding year on year, each year solid growth will actually get you to a pretty fantastic place very, very quickly, guys. Um, on that note, guys, I'm going to wrap it up here. Check out my course below. The course coupon is freedom. If you want to know how to build long-term wealth, you want to ask me any questions after this chat, guys, hop over to our Discord. Um, the way to get there, again, is through the Patreon link, which is below and above. It's 50 cents a day if you join us for the year you get a free month off as well it's a fantastic research-based community and you can ask me all the questions you want guys uh, so um here is my the course curriculum as it stands at the moment investing strategy advanced investing ta technical analysis advanced technical analysis and then practical economics uh, i'm an economist uh, by by training uh, and a lawyer i used to work for a bank for a little while guys so check it out uh, psychology and lots of bonus materials and this is growing as we go along um thank you very much guys there'll be lots more coverage out this weekend so make sure you are subscribed and i look forward to seeing you all in the next video